Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we take a look at what the U.S. Department of Energy calls consent-based siting for radioactive nuclear waste dumps. But once you scratch the surface of their process, it starts to look like it's non-consent. We hear the facts up close and personal with two activists whose communities are ground zero in this process. Karen Haddon of the SEED Coalition on the DOE presenting the false impression that West Texas and New Mexico really want, they really, really want to become the country's nuclear waste dumping ground. Then we hear from Beatrice Brailsford of Idaho's Snake River Alliance on how up there they are fighting not to have the Idaho National Laboratories take on more nuclear waste than it already has. Plus, you'll be hearing our numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than will be mentioned in the entirety of the Republican National Convention. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, July 19, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. First, a correction. In last week's show, which was recorded as results from Japan's national elections were still coming in, I jumped the gun and announced that rock musician Yohei Miyake had succeeded in his bid to get elected to the Diet, Japan's upper house. While early returns were promising, unfortunately, Miyake did not win. Also, I've been informed by a listener that he performs reggae, not rock. My apologies on both counts. In the U.S., 22 security guards at the Palisades Nuclear Power Plant in Michigan have been placed on leave for falsifying fire inspection records. These fire inspections are part of a commitment made by licensees instead of of upgrading or modifying nuclear power plants to remove the threat of fires affecting the performance of critical safety systems. Several of the security officers placed on leave have told reporters that they are being treated as scapegoats by plant management and claim they were never trained to perform the fire inspections. He said, she said, gotta get to the duck (coughs) and cover report. On Monday, July 18, nine, count them, nine different nuclear facilities all had the exact same loss of off-site communications capability. In Illinois, Dresden, Braidwood, Byron, Clinton, LaSalle, and Quad Cities, Pennsylvania, Three Mile Island and Limerick, and Nine Mile Point in New York, all experienced an emergency notification system that would not notify all the individuals they were supposed to within the 10 minutes of system initiation as required. (coughs) At Brunswick in North Carolina on July 12th, an alert was declared for a fire in the service water building. An alert is level two on a four-level step system to kiss your ass goodbye. This is Brunswick's second NRC notification in a week. (coughs) Second week for a row for Fermi in Michigan on the 13th of July. During a thunderstorm, the technical specifications for secondary containment pressure boundary was not met numerous times. Again, this is an event or condition that could have prevented the fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. Palo Verde in Arizona on the 12th, a degraded fire seal barrier that provides one-hour separation between two fire zones was identified. (coughs) Two environmental groups are suing Florida Power and Light over Turkey Point nuclear power plant's pollution in Biscayne Bay. The legal action comes after regulators found more than 200 times the daily quote-unquote acceptable, nobody asked me if I'm accepting it, nobody asked you if you're accepting it, but 200 times the daily quote-unquote acceptable level of tritium, a radioactive isotope, in the Biscayne Bay water. 
The presence of tritium indicates that the plant's cooling canals are leaking, which is why the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and the Tropical Audubon Society are suing to demand that FPL, Florida Power and Light, pay for its share of the cleanup. What a concept! In Washington, D.C., in a rare showing of bipartisan cooperation, on July 13, two members of the St. Louis congressional delegation demanded that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers be put in charge of the radioactively contaminated Westlake landfill cleanup in Bridgeton, Missouri. Representatives Ann Wagner, a Republican, and William Lacey Clay, a Democrat, made impassioned appeals to their colleagues on the Environment and the Economy Subcommittee to allow a floor vote on a bill that would shift control of the site to the core. Wagner said the EPA has failed for more than 30 years in its cleanup of nuclear waste dating back to the Manhattan Project and World War II. She accused the agency of years of dereliction and inaction and said it has failed people in the most heartless manner possible. The legislation has been stalled in the subcommittee for months, mainly due to the opposition of Representative Frank Pallone, a Democrat of New Jersey, the ranking minority member on the panel. And why might Representative Pallone be blocking this bill, let alone walking out when the testimony is being given? Could it be because he is married to Sarah Hospidor Pallone? an EPA Deputy Associate Administrator for Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations? You think the pillow talk might have something to do with it? Isn't there an ethics committee to make you recuse yourself if there is a conflict of interest? And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Undercover inspectors working for the U.S. Government Accountability Office were able to fool the Nuclear Regulatory Commission into granting it licenses to acquire material necessary to build a dirty bomb, a crude yet efficient nuclear device. The GAO established several dummy corporations and did not take steps to make it appear as if these dummy corporations were legitimate businesses. And yet, in one of the three test cases... The NRC granted a license to the fake organization, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, protecting people and the environment. Not. And that's why, NRC, yet again, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. In Japan, the decommissioning authority in charge of dealing with the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear disaster is now considering a Chernobyl-style sarcophagus to entomb the failed reactors rather than attempting to remove the melted fuel, debris, and buildings. They did not elaborate about why it is now being officially added to the considered options for the disaster site. Seventeen samples from British Columbia's coastal waters show low levels of cesium-137, which indicates that the leading edge of the Fukushima plume is in British Columbia's coastal waters. And the attempted coup in Turkey on Friday, July 15, and the subsequent closure of the Encirlik Air Base in the south of the country have raised fresh questions about the wisdom of the U.S. stationing the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons in Europe at such a vulnerable site only 68 miles from the Syrian border. Raise lots of questions. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first, donations are the lifeblood of Nuclear Hot Seat. They help me meet the monthly online charges, social media promotion strategies, and provide the funds for me to travel to cover events important to this community and our cause. One of the most important of the year is the annual Excellence in Journalism Conference, where more than 1,000 reporters, news directors, syndicators, and all levels of news professionals gather to talk shop, learn tools, and sometimes learn about stories they otherwise would not know to cover, like ours. I'm also going to be asking professional newsroom staff what, if any, support or obstruction they've met with when they attempt to cover nuclear stories. That'll prove real interesting. That's what I'm going there to do. Plant some seeds, stir up some interest, provoke concern, 
direct them towards their local nuclear stories, along with the online resources and, and groups in their community that can give them our side of the story as their focus. Excellence in Journalism is September 18 to 20 in New Orleans. My thanks to those of you who have already donated to help me cover the costs of my airfare and entry fees. Now we have to keep going because I still need to raise the funds to cover the rest. Housing, meals, ground transportation, and the miscellany that does accumulate. So won't you help me get to New Orleans to kick some mainstream media tosses? I'm asking you to help with a donation of any size. What you'd pay for a cup of coffee and a tip or something larger. Anything and everything will help me make as much noise as I can on behalf of getting the coverage that will help us all put the brakes on the nuclear menace. You can make your donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Just click on the big red Donate button. You can donate through PayPal, with your credit card directly, or if you prefer to go the old-fashioned way, email me at info at NuclearHotSeat.com and you will receive in return a snail mail address where you can send the check. Know that I am deeply grateful for whatever you can do to help. Consent-based siting of nuclear waste dumps. Sounds like a democratic process, doesn't it? That's what the Department of Energy is talking about with local communities before unloading untold tons of radioactive waste on them. But when is consent not consent? And when does no not mean no? at least as far as the DOE is concerned. Two activists share what's happening in their communities, both of which have been targeted as ground zero in the nuclear industry's never-ending quest to kick the radioactive can of plutonium-contaminated reactor waste down the road. First, we talk with Karen Haddon, Executive Director of Sustainable Energy and Economic Development, or SEED Coalition, which is headquartered in Austin, Texas. She's a regular source of information for Nuclear a Hot Seat, and I always have a great time talking with her when we do our interviews. Karen Haddon, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Glad to be here. In a recent email, you described the Department of Energy process for consent-based siting of nuclear waste dumps as, and here I quote, a farce wrapped inside of a sham of a mockery, <laughs> coated, coated with absurdity, illogicality, and insanity. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, what did you think of the play? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has been very, very frustrating to deal with the Department of Energy. They are holding hearings around the country and trying to make it look like they're taking public input they spend most of the time talking themselves, not letting citizens talk. They bring in so-called experts who basically back up what they want to have said. Then they let people ask a couple questions. Then they break into small groups so that if anybody's angry or upset with what they've heard, they can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and assure them how much they are listening. And then at the very end, after these hours, they let people have some public comment which is, you know, you cannot count on media being there that long. So this is all a huge dog and pony show, and it is a farce. They are not really wanting to get input from people. They're trying to talk people into accepting them dumping radioactive waste on our communities. You're based in Texas. How has this been playing out in the Texas, New Mexico area? Well, we are ground zero for the nation's radioactive waste, the high-level radioactive waste from nuclear reactors around the country. No one wants this stuff, but they have decided that the Texas-New Mexico border region is a great place to take it and put it, and there are people who live there and work there, and they have lives and cattle and agriculture, and there is a major aquifer nearby, but that is what the DOE is trying to accomplish. And so they're holding these hearings, and they're, it's as if they drew a big arc around the country and decided to hold them everywhere else 
but Texas and New Mexico. This is the seventh hearing that happened uh, last night, and still none, not a single one, is in Texas and New Mexico. And we hear the agency saying, oh, we want to know how people feel about this, and, you know, we are hoping communities will volunteer. Well, they know full well that waste control specialists in Andrews County already has a license application submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They did that in April. And the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, has a little videotape saying, oh, we haven't decided on a place. It's like, yes, you have. <laughs> we know that we are being targeted and, and quit lying to us. It has been incredibly frustrating. And so eight people came from Texas and New Mexico to the hearing it was July 14th in Tempe, Arizona. We had to travel. It was, you know, an average of $400 a piece for airline tickets to get there because they refused to come to Texas or New Mexico. And we did tell them that we do not consent because this agency has been going around the country and telling people that Texas and New Mexico want high-level radioactive waste and asking people, how do you feel about sending it from your backyard and sending it to these people who want it. Well, that is just plain wrong because we do not want it, just like any other community. No one wants this in their backyard. WCS is the place that has been taking the waste that was supposed to go to the waste isolation pilot plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, which, of course, has been closed down since Valentine's Day of 2014 when there was an underground accident, an explosion of a 55-gallon container of waste from the Los Alamos lab that contaminated the underground. Some of it got out through the ventilation shaft. And the need to put the waste that was going to be shipped to WIP, as it's commonly known, was then taken up by WCS in Andrews. But that facility only has the approval or the rating for low-level waste. Is that correct? That is correct, and that has happened right now. WCS, it stands for Waste Control Specialist. They're a Dallas-based company headed by a billionaire who has passed away, and now it's his family. That company is now accepting this whip waste and has it on site it has already stayed past its one-year uh, deadline, and they got approval to keep it longer. And these are the potentially exploding barrels that, like you said, they released americium and plutonium, which was tracked at least 26 miles from the WIP site. We have 100 potentially exploding barrels at this site. There is also a site for hazardous and explosive toxic chemicals, a RECRIS site, uh, waste site right across from the pits of low-level radioactive waste, and then the storage facility where they want to bring the high-level waste would be right next to those pits. So this makes no sense to put all these things together. It's a massive science experiment. It's like mad scientists are at the helm, and you have a hard time understanding that if anyone's even thinking about this because of the outrageous nature of combining these things in one place. The storage facility also at WCS as it currently exists, to my understanding, is either above ground or only slightly underground as opposed to a deep geologic repository. That's right. And they go about 180 feet deep at the most in their waste pits. So, right, this is not at all the same as the WIP site, you know, with the half a mile underground. That is absolutely right. If they bring the high-level waste, that would be above ground on a storage pad in these dry cask systems. And one of the pieces of news on that front is that while WCS has submitted their application, the NRC actually did not like what they saw. They thought it was very, very deficient, and they have laid out quite a number of items that they want more information on, and some of it was major, major pieces of information in terms of engineering, in terms of getting a monitoring system that should be in place, in terms of how are you going to actually do these procedures, 
How will your crane hold up to that weight? How will these casks take the hotter temperatures of the desert? Uh, how will you protect the aquifer? So it was a pretty serious write-up by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and so WCS has a lot more work to do on their application at this time. How can the Department of Energy ensure that the process for selecting a site is fair, if indeed having a site on U.S. soil is feasible at all? They need to be talking to the people who would really live and work at ground zero of any site. And they know darn well that they're really, really looking at Texas, New Mexico. It's not like they have other sites off the books, but they are secondary. Idaho is a possibility still. But they need to talk to the people. And again, they have not held a single hearing. It's as if they cannot find our two states on a map. I found myself circling the states and about ready to hand it to them at one point during the hearing the other night in Tempe. Uh, but they are not talking to the people and they're not allowing a vote. In Andrews, Texas, it's about 15,000 people roughly in the county, they never got to vote. Five people put their signatures on a resolution last year to do a deal with waste control specialists, but that did not represent the community. The community really didn't even know what was going on. Who are those five people and what they the right to sign that resolution? They are the county commissioners, and the county would benefit financially from this deal, and they have benefited financially from the low-level radioactive waste. So WCS came to them and said, hey, do you want to have some more money flowing into the county? And they said yes, and they signed a resolution. Well, that is not the same as a process where they really went to the community, told them what they were doing, and then let people vote on it. And when we've been out to Anders and worked with local citizens, nine out of ten people, if not more, would tell you they do not want it. And a lot of them did not know that this was going on. And when they do learn about it, they are not happy. What models of experience should the Department of Energy, the DOE, use in designing this process? Well, first of all, the citizens in the affected communities should be asked first and foremost. And the agency should not tell people around the rest of the country that a community wants this radioactive waste when there is not real evidence that that is, in fact, true, uh, because that is what's happening at the moment. There should be a vote taken. It should not be left just to legislators because the companies that want this radioactive waste dump, there's a lot of money involved, and they can do the campaign contributions, and they can twist arms and make things happen. So it really needs to be a vote of the people. And every county through which this radioactive waste would travel should also have a voice in whether or not to consent to this plan. And all counties that it would travel through should have given consent for this to even be considered to move forward at minimum. They are all at risk financially, environmentally, and in terms of people's health. If one of these casks breaks open, which of course we're assured could never happen, these casks cannot be repaired if they're broken. Some of them have been sitting out on sites for up to 20 years. We don't even know that they're in good enough shape to send them here to begin with. If they get cracked, there's really no way to fix them, and that's according to Holtec, the president of the company, who said that they cannot be repaired. So we don't think that this is a safe thing to put these on the road. The safest thing, and this was the NRC that, that has said in the past, that the safest thing is to leave them at the site of generation or nearby. If you're close to the ocean and you've got tides to worry about, maybe move them inland some, but do not put them on trains or trucks across the country. We worry a great deal about truck accidents. The company is now saying, WCS, that they want to use mostly trains. Well, we've had several serious train accidents in Texas in this past year. One train ran off the tracks in Corsicana and, and flipped over into a flooded area. And just this past month, two trains collided head-on going 60 or 70 miles per hour near Amarillo. And that disaster has left 
many, many train cars crumpled up in a huge pile. Three people were killed. They can't even find one of the bodies. They've taken two weeks, and they can't clear the tracks yet. So if that train had been carrying radioactive waste, there is no telling the extent and magnitude of the disaster that we would see. So shipping this stuff, when we're talking about consolidated storage, it's not even a permanent facility. It just makes no sense. And we know pretty well that what would likely happen is that if they got that waste here for so-called storage, it would end up staying there forever at a site that was not researched and not developed for permanent disposal. And the safety factors would not have even been adequately considered at all. Two things come to mind here. Listeners to this show are very familiar with the problems with the whole tech dry cask because we've had Donna Gilmore from San Onofre Safety on multiple times, and she's the one who's been bird-dogging this and discovering and actually has the head of Holtec on videotape admitting the things that you just said, that they cannot be repaired and that a microscopic crack could release millions of rem of radiation into the environment. The other is the fact that they want to put this in a site that is not designed for long-term storage, brings up the image of what's happening in North St. Louis with the people who live near the Westlake landfill, which has nuclear weapons waste from World War II, some of it going back as far as the purification of the uranium, which started in 1942. It's in a pit there. It's not remediated. It can migrate. It has migrated, and there are severe health problems showing up, and there are other factors there as well. But it's setting us up for a problem that kicks the real problem of it down the road where perhaps our current group of bureaucrats will not have to deal with it. They will be out of the line of fire by the time push comes to shove, but that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a severe consequence or the potential for multiple severe consequences down the line. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't agree more. That's the kind of the nature of what we're dealing with. And, you know, we get safety assurances left and right, but the fact remains that, you know, there are so many examples of major accidents and spills and leaks and disasters that it's really hard to to trust any of these claims that this will all be safe. And we really feel like we are being singled out as a dumping ground. Of huge concern is the fact that the communities that they want to dump on, they're relatively small communities, Andrews, Texas, and the nearest of all is Eunice, New Mexico, just five miles from the site. These communities not only did not get to vote, and the DOE did not come here to talk about consent, but they also are largely Hispanic communities. They're not wealthy, and they don't have the resources to fight back. In my mind, this is the most extreme example of environmental racism that you could find to take the most toxic waste in the whole country and dump it on a largely Hispanic community and call that consent. And to add to it, the DOE is trying to come up with some pilot money, and it's from a very small amount of money in the scheme of things, about $100,000 for a community to learn more and to understand about it. That's propaganda. And it's a bribe, and we all know it. And they all said, oh, this is not a bribe. They actually said that. And in the world of don't think of an elephant, you know, to hear them say this is not a bribe, it's like, right. <laughs> it's outrageous. The agency is just being so facetious on every front in this whole process. They're acting like they don't know what's going on in terms of real license applications. They're telling people we want this waste. They're saying we haven't picked a site yet. It's like, yes, you have. <laughs> you just won't admit to it. We're, it. It's just more frustrating than you can imagine. You know, the eighth hearing is coming up in Minneapolis on July 21st, and we're hoping some of the local people will speak out about the injustice here and, and also about the safety aspect for the whole country. It is not safe to put this stuff on trains and trucks and ship it across the country. We shouldn't do that unless there was really, truly enough science to say we now have a scientifically valid permanent repository. 
And probably that would be deep underground, not above ground, like this West Texas site, which has extreme temperatures, storms, wildfires, and seismic activity to some extent, and has fracking all around it, so the seismic activity could increase. To top it off, you've got the Ogallala Aquifer just above the site, if not below it, and that lies underneath eight states. It's the largest aquifer in the country. If it becomes contaminated, there's no telling the extent of contamination for the whole country that this would represent. So the company that wants to take this waste has a bad record to start with as well. Early on, when they started accepting the low-level waste, they had their own workers get exposed to radiation in the cafeteria on an ongoing basis, and some of them more seriously than others. But I call that careless and reckless, and I don't think that this company is one that should be handling high-level radioactive waste, the most dangerous of all. The arrogance of those people who are trying to manipulate your area as a permanent repository is just, it's beyond comprehension. Is it still possible to force the Department of Energy to hold hearings in or near Andrews so that there can be genuine input from the local community? You know, it seems like It would be a waste of time and energy. They have told us, oh, well, if you invited us down, we would come. But it's pretty clear already that they're not listening to people where they are going. You know, they're putting speakers off till the very end. We asked them to rearrange their whole meeting format because we didn't really want to spend our time sitting in little groups helping them and and getting sucked into their process. I think they're trying to get people to feel invested in this process and helping solve the problem. Well, I think, you know, the important thing to be talking about here is, no, we don't want this to happen. So, no, I mean, I don't think we need to sit in small groups and figure out how to make it happen. So I don't know that it really would be useful even if they did come. They've made clear how they feel about Texas and New Mexico by their original scheduling. If they can do eight meetings everywhere else and not a single one at ground zero, that says a lot right there. And we have only so much time and energy in Texas and New Mexico. And right now we're more focused on fighting the license application than anything else. Um, The waste control specialist license application and was filed April 28th, And we really need to spend all of our time and energy right now fighting it because this battle is underway. It has begun. And for the NRC or or the DOE to come to our community now would take a huge amount of organizing and resources to get people there and take us away from doing what we really need to do right now to fight back. The DOE has already made clear how little they regard our opinions and we will be submitting comments in writing. We did have people go to Arizona, but again, that was at great expense, and about only eight people could go at all. It was very expensive to get people there and took a lot of time and energy. What can listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat, who are so invested in all aspects of this issue, what can we do to support you and help you along with this? Thank you for that question. The DOE has a consent-based citing website, and it has on there a link and an email address for commenting up until midnight of July 31st. And any comments that people can send in are greatly appreciated. We would love it if people could point out um, the injustice that's involved here that the DOE failed to come to the people most impacted from the start, that they are in fact targeting a largely Hispanic community that has limited resources, and that the safest approach to handling this high-level waste is to move it as little as possible, especially until a permanent repository that is found to be scientifically valid can be developed. If we ever chose to move it at all, it should be one time to a permanent site. And we don't even know if that is a real possibility or not, 
because the science has not been done. But if it's going to be moved, that is the only circumstances under which it should be moved. Any comments to the DOE would be very, very greatly appreciated. Well, we will put that link up on the website under this episode, which is number 265. And we, of course, want to know what's going on. It's This story isn't going away because nothing about nuclear ever goes away by itself. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Always enjoy it. That was Karen Haddon, Executive Director of the Sustainable Energy and Economic Development, or SEED, coalition, headquartered in Austin, Texas. In five years of producing Nuclear Hot Seat, I've mentioned Idaho on occasion in connection with the story, but never fully understood the importance of that state to our shared nuclear history. I filled in a lot of blanks in my understanding of a wide range of stories after I interviewed Beatrice Brailsford. She is the Nuclear Program Director of the Snake River Alliance in Pocatello, Idaho, and she covers not only the history of the Idaho National Laboratory, but connects the dots in the nuclear waste stream as it currently plays out. Beatrice Brailsford, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much. First of all, tell us what your group is and how you got involved with it. The Snake River Alliance was founded in 1979. We are Idaho's grassroots nuclear watchdog and clean energy advocate. In 1979, two small groups of people met serendipitously on neighboring park benches in Boise, Idaho. And one small group was worried about the Three Mile Island accident. And the other park bench was filled with people who had just read in the Boise newspaper that the Idaho National Laboratory routinely injected hazardous and radioactive waste into the Snake River Aquifer. The Snake River Aquifer is in fact the lifeblood of Southern Idaho. It is the basis of our agriculture, and most important of all, it is the sole source of drinking water for over 300,000 of our friends and neighbors. So those two groups recognized what they were doing, joined together that evening, and we've been together ever since. We started working on clean energy in 2007. I have been with the Alliance since 1987 first as a volunteer, and then I've been on staff for quite a while. What is the nuclear background for Idaho? The Idaho National Laboratory was founded in 1949. It is in eastern Idaho. It is in the Arco Desert, which is part of Idaho's high desert plain. The Idaho National Laboratory is the largest Department of Energy site It is 890 square miles, and it sits at the base of the Lemhi Mountain Range and the Lost River Mountain Range. It is in a beautiful part of our state. People have lived there for 13,000 years. So, you know, you hear over and over that the desert is somehow in the middle of nowhere, and people have always been living there, and the Shoshone-Bannock people where the Idaho National Laboratory is, was their ancestral land. Unfortunately, INL was also built on the upstream end of the Snake River Aquifer, and that's what I referred to before. The aquifer underlies 10,000 square miles of southern Idaho, and it has as much water in it as Lake Erie. It flows about 20 feet a day, and it is incredibly important to us. What INL has done over the years, it was established actually as the National Reactor Testing Station to look at commercial nuclear power. But, you know, it was founded in 1949. By the early 50s, it was involved in the weapons program. We were the place where nearly all the plutonium contaminated waste from the Rocky Flats weapons plant in Colorado was trucked and trained to Idaho, and until 1970, dumped in unlined pits and trenches. 
and it's in a very large nuclear waste dump there. It is being cleaned up under the Superfund program. And also the Idaho National Laboratory is sort of the birthplace of the nuclear Navy. And that's because the prototype reactor for the USS Nautilus, our first nuclear-powered vessel, was tested at INL. And somehow, being the birthplace of the nuclear Navy meant we are also its final port of call. All nuclear Navy spent fuel comes to Idaho, every scrap. INL itself has been the site of 52 reactors. So we have produced spent fuel of our own. And we still receive all the spent fuel from the nuclear Navy. We receive some spent fuel from foreign research reactors and from uh, domestic research reactors. We have received commercial spent nuclear fuel from Shipping Port and Peach Bottom, for instance, and Fort St. Vrain in Colorado. And the Three Mile Island core debris was brought to Idaho, uh, ostensibly for a research project. But in fact, by the time those last shipments came in, the research project was over and we're just uh, storing it. So Idaho has a very long history with receiving nuclear waste from other places and a very long history of resisting that. We have had some very fine public officials, most notably Senator Frank Church and Governor Cecil Andrus, and they've both fought very hard to stem the flow of waste coming in. As early as 1974, I mean, you know, so that was a long time ago, the governor named a Blue Ribbon Commission, and the Blue Ribbon Commission went around the state speaking to Idahoans about a proposal from the Department of Energy to bring in spent fuel from commercial reactors. And the people in Idaho said no. The Blue Ribbon Commission went back to the governor and said the people of Idaho say no. And furthermore, the commission recommended that commercial spent fuel stay at the reactors until there was a disposal site for permanent disposal ready to receive it. And that's obviously our position as well. We were one of the groups, public interest groups from all 50 states, signed on to a letter in 2010. That was one of its recommendations, that we do not ship spent fuel unnecessarily. So, you know, now we have a very strong shield against commercial spent fuel coming in. In the early 90s, the Snake River Alliance started bearing witness to every shipment of spent fuel that came in. And at that point, it was all coming in from the nuclear Navy. We would get word that a shipment was on its way. And I live in a railroad town. So we would go to the tracks and stand on an overpass, sometimes for hours, waiting for the shipment to come in, often in the middle of the night. You know, since it was nuclear Navy fuel, it was always accompanied by armed guards. And we nurtured some of that concern here in Idaho. The state of Idaho went to court, forced the Department of Energy and the nuclear Navy to the settlement table and signed a settlement agreement in 1995, which, among many of its conditions, bans commercial spent fuel from coming to the state. This is a remarkable example of citizen activism, seemingly successful citizen activism, against the nuclear megalith monster that is out there. What has happened between then and now that seems to put Idaho at risk when we start talking about consent-based siting of a nuclear waste dump? We got a very aggressive contractor at the Idaho National Laboratory, Battelle, which wants spent fuel as a raw material for research projects. And those research projects are described, you know, they start off small and then they grow. There really is a, a camel, a nose, and a tent in this scenario. So I think that happened. Obviously, the fantasy that Yucca Mountain was going to open someday, the federal government has had to abandon that fantasy. One of the elements of legitimate consent is that it be free. 
that there be no bribes and no threats. Company towns and the town where INL is near is a company town, is as susceptible to those threats as any other company town. You know, and the threat is if you don't let us build our factory bigger or take in more spent fuel, your town is going to dry up and blow away. I think that's been resonating fairly strongly over here in eastern Idaho and has activated some pretty powerful political movers. You know, we do have an activist community and we do have this shield. So I think we are far better off perhaps than some other locations. But I do think, you know, 890 square miles of desert, it's got some appeal if you're looking for some place that is ostensibly in the middle of nowhere. And you've clearly made the point that there's a lot of somewhere there in the middle of what most people would think of as nowhere. It sounds like you have as much protection as a state could possibly have, and yet You've spoken of these weaknesses in terms of the pressure points that can be used. How has this latest push by the Energy Department for consent-based siting begun to play itself out in your area, in Idaho? It has increased the interest in accepting spent fuel in some parts of the state, notably eastern Idaho, where the economic impact of the Idaho National Laboratory is the greatest. When this first start came up, people would stop me and say, now hold it, didn't we decide this already? Didn't we vote on this? And there is an underlying pressure to renegotiate the settlement agreement, which the state of Idaho can do if the state wants it. I don't think the federal government can do that, but the state can do that. The job it has given the Snake River Alliance to do is to express very clearly everywhere that a very important part of consent is non-consent. If you're asking someone to say yes, if that someone, entity of any kind, says no, you have to hear that, you have to recognize it, and you have to respect it. And as far as we're concerned, we opted out, you know, because the DOE is kind of worried about when are communities going to be allowed to, quote, opt out. We opted out in 1996. Stop asking. What's the political climate at this point? Do you still have the strong support from the governor and from the Senate? No. The leadership in Idaho is nuclearized as far as I'm concerned. It's far more receptive to the blandishments of the nuclear endeavor. So I think we do have our work cut out for us, but I think, I think we can win again. That would be my fondest hope as well, you and everybody else where yes. this is going. Where are you now? I understand that there was a meeting in your area with the DOE. DOE has had seven of eight meetings across the country. You know, Boston, Chicago, Atlanta, Sacramento, Phoenix, or Tempe, I guess, Denver. And we had ours last night. It was in Boise, which is on the other side of the state. And Boise is also where I think maybe a fourth or a third of the people of Idaho live in that area, in that region. So it's quite far away from the Idaho National Laboratory. So the meeting was in Boise. Boise is the smallest town of any of the meeting locations DOE has gone to, and it had the largest crowd. I think we did a very good job of reminding the Department of Energy that we have said no. I think we will have to continue to do that, but at the meeting last night, there were a few people speaking in favor of letting spent fuel into Idaho. No, no, I shouldn't say that because most of the people who spoke, and there were maybe only two or three, they were not from Idaho. They were from nuclear organizations. Our members, I thought, did a splendid job, dominated the conversation, 
I think, expressed concerns in a very responsible, respectful way. Today, I was at a meeting on this end of the state, and one of the people from the Shoshone Bannock tribes who was there last night described the grassroots effort as, quote, incredible. And then somebody else said, Idahoans are nice. You know, we're nice, polite people. And I'm glad to say that everyone treated one another with respect last night. I do think that the Department of Energy heard the message in a very unmistakable way. You know, our first job is to protect Idaho. I was on the panel, but our members as well in small groups spoke out very clearly against the inadvisability of consolidating spent fuel on an interim basis. So, you know, when you said you had spoken to Karen Haddon, I think everyone knows that the Sink River Alliance would never say, no, ship it over there. You know, once it's happened to you, you don't do it to anybody else. Nobody in this movement wants that waste anywhere near anyone on the face of the planet. We've created this problem. Something has to be done. Everything that's being suggested so far makes no sense and is not taking long-term planning into account. We don't want bureaucrats and nuclear industries' idea of the solution being rammed down our throat. Right. And as Karen made the point, and I find it fascinating, as you listed the cities where the meetings took place, none of them is near where the waste would be dumped. So the local people are not being consulted. It's like they're being ramrodded into it. It's very interesting. You know, DOE keeps saying it has not chosen a site, but it's obviously very tempted by the moves of some elements of New Mexico and Texas to welcome nuclear waste. So DOE hasn't had any meetings there. It also hasn't had any meetings in reactor communities, which is also odd because, you know, we have to remember Spent fuel really is somewhere already. It is in interim storage. And the communities never bargained for long-term storage. Well, you know, frankly, they've had long-term storage already. I have heard at least one community leader from a reactor community, you know, where the reactor is only now shutting down, and they're seeing how much they will lose you know, some of their neighbors won't have jobs. And maybe ask that community, would you like a contract to store spent fuel for 30 more years or something? But I do think it's very interesting that they haven't gone to Texas and New Mexico and they haven't gone to a reactor community. And those are obviously places that have got a lot of stake in this. What is the next area that you need to be focused on? Until there is a permanent solution to nuclear waste, places like eastern Idaho will always be at risk. And so we can never take our eye off that ball. The Idaho National Laboratory is a Superfund site. It was named to the Superfund list in 1989. There has been a lot of cleanup, $9 billion worth. There's a lot more cleanup to do. We have been probably the steadiest advocate for that program of anybody in the state, and we will most certainly continue to do that. There is a proposal to build a small modular reactor on the site. It would be built by New Scale, which is a company out of Corvallis, Oregon. It would be owned by UAMPS, which is the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. So it's little munis in Utah, you know, around the West, but I mean little. Some of them are really little. And then run by Energy Northwest, that's the folks who ran Whoops right on the Columbia River. Which is now known as Columbia Generating Station. Right. Yes, indeed it is. And Which is really a whoops, but that's another story. <laughs> there, there you do. We, we cover that a lot. Uh -huh. So it's supposed to be built on INL. They're getting quite a bit of federal money. I'm sure they will get more. You know, you never want to think that something that foolish will actually occur, but it has in the past, and we will certainly be working hard to stop that. 
because it's a nuclear reactor in a different shape. It poses all the same risks, one of the most important ones of which it sucks all the air out of the room when you talk about renewable energy. Because, you know, people want to look for the silver bullet. Oh, look, here's a nuclear reactor. You know, the nuclear industry is dying. Nuclear reactors are being shut down. And I think that that gives even more impetus to better energy solutions. And I think, you know, things like small modular reactors are just red herrings. So we'll be working on that as well. I have no doubt but that they will. That was Beatrice Brailsford of the Snake River Alliance in Idaho. You can find out more about the group at snakeriveralliance.org. Activist shout out! As Karen Haddon reminded us, we have until July 31st of this year, 2016, to let the Department of Energy know that you do not consent to quote-unquote consent-based siting of radioactive waste dumps and mobile Chernobyls on our roads and rails. We need comments going into the NRC by the 31st. One minute to midnight on 31st, you can still get it in. We'll have a link up at NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 265. Go, state your piece, let the NRC have a piece of your mind. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 19, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from Informable.com, WWMT.com, CapeCod.com, MiamiTimes.com, St. Louis SunTimes.com, FirstSecretCity.com, St. Louis Today.com, SalsaLabs.com, FreeBeacon.com, EnviroReporter.com, FukuLeaks.org, FukushimaInform.co, TheGuardian.com, NSNBC.me, GlobeAndMail.ca, MiningAwareness.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the fantastic activists who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are all invited to join us and like us, really, really like us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and it was recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know an online aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. You can also check out our archive of 265 shows on our website, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcasts. If you would like to receive an email every week that contains Nuclear Hot Seat's link and a little bit of information about what's in the show, go to the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, and in the big yellow box, it's an opt-in box, just put in your name and your email address. You will not only start getting the email, but you also receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. The full ebook is available on Amazon. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We're copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.